What remains to be done is to understand the normal bundle of a line L inside of a surface S. And let's start computing uh, with the objects that we know and we can recognize. So we begin by writing the equation TL goes to TS restricted to L goes to NLS. So this is the defining exact sequence of the normal bundle. One of these objects I already recognize, TL, the tangent bundle of L. This is isomorphic to the degree 2 bundle on P1. So L is isomorphic to P1 and the line bundles are characterized by their degree, so I'm saying the tangent bundle has degree 2. In other words, the global section of this tangent bundle will have two zeros counted with multiplicity. But uh, you might have heard of this as the hairy ball theorem. So remember P1, if you view it as or the complex numbers, is a sphere. So the sphere, if you take the uh, section of the tangent bundle, uh, should have two zeros. The analog of this is that suppose our uh, sphere is hairy and we comb the hairs flat, that means each hair is pointing to a tangent direction. So it's like choosing a section of the tangent bundle. Then there will be two bold points, two swirls, and that's exactly the statement that the tangent bundle is isomorphic to OP1, 2. And our heads are like spheres, you know, we have a bold po point here, and there would be another one here if we were covered with hair. Okay, so that's just OP1, 2. Uh, and the other thing, TS, we don't know at the moment, but we will have to compute it. When, once we do, then we will know NLS, because we have the following formula. But if I fake, take the second wedge product of TS, that means I'm taking the determinant of TS, so the second wedge is the maximal wedge I can take, TS is rank 2, uh, and restricted to L, and this is just isomorphic to TL tensor NLS. So this is a standard result if you know about uh, coherent sheaves, so it's a standard exercise in Hartshorn, for example, that uh, the m determinant of the middle term is the tensor product of the determinants of the two outer terms, TL and NLS, but the determinant of these line bundles, TL and NLS, are just themselves, they're rank 1, hence the expression on the right. So I know TL, if I find out wedge 2 of TS, I'm done. So how do we do this? We write the same kind of expression, but in the larger space. I'm going to inject TS, the tangent bundle of S, into the tangent bundle of P3, and of course, this has to be restricted to S. Now the quotient is by definition the normal bundle of S inside of P3. And we do the same thing. I compute the determinant of the central term. It's the tensor product of the determinants of the outer terms. So what that gives me is that wedge 3 of TP3 restricted to S is isomorphically wedge 2 TS tensor NSP3. So the surface has co-dimension 1 inside of P3, so its normal bundle has to have rank 1. So at every point there's only one dimensional choice of normal directions. The tangent bundle of P3 was of course rank 3, and so I took the third wedge uh, when I'm computing this. So now I actually know everything else here. First, let's start with the analog of the hairy ball theorem in higher dimensions. The, you say that the third wedge product of TP3, this is isomorphic to OP3, 4. So the, this is a line bundle, since I've taken the determinant of a vector bundle, it's a line bundle. And this line bundle has degree 4 inside of P3, that's what it means. So the general formula, maybe you can guess by these <laughs> two numbers, but the general formula is this. So the determinant of the tangent bundle of Pn has degree n plus 1. And we have one more thing to figure out, that's the normal bundle of S. Convincing yourself that this is true uh, is harder, but I will say a few things about why it's actually trivially true. Ns of P3 ends up being isomorphic to the sheaf of functions on P3 with a pole on S. So let me expand this out. But then this is in fact just isomorphic to the OP3 of D. 
that's another sheaf, another line bundle. This kind of construction is in general true. Whenever you have something smooth inside a smooth space, and if the codimension of what you have inside is one, then it's normal bundle can be easily explained by regular functions with a pole along that uh, codimension one object. And the equations are actually, the justification is very simple. You have to dualize the sequence over here. So this sequence over here, you can dualize, and then you get the kernel of the cotangent bundle. And uh, this kernel is actually very easy to describe as just uh, differentials of the functions describing S. So this is how people prove it. But you have seen it uh, probably, and if not, you can take this to be a fact. Okay, we're done now. I just put together the pieces. First, the determinant of the tangent bundle of S is the product of the determinant of the tangent bundle of P3 restricted to S times the dual of the normal bundle of S inside of P3. All of these we now know as Sim simple line bundles. This is just isomorphic to OP3 core tensor OP3 minus D. I dualized the normal bundle and all of this restricted to S. The other thing is to plug this into the formula describing the normal bundle of the line inside of S. Okay, I just plugged in the values that we have computed. Uh, I'm restricting the degree 4 minus d line bundle on P3, first to S, then to L, hence the first expression. And what I can do right now is to use the fact that L is a line inside of P3. So something of degree 1, a degree 1 form, uh, will pull back to a degree 1 form on L. Something of degree 4 minus d will pull back to something of degree 4 minus d. So this is O p1 4 minus d tensor op1 minus 2 and this is op1 2 minus d and at this point we're done so the normal bundle has degree 2 minus d on p1 therefore it will not have sections if degree is greater than 2 so we can summarize these results because here we also see what's going to happen when d equals 1 or 2. So we were interested in the global sections of the normal bundle of L inside of S. So that's this space. And we just uh, represented these things in terms of more familiar objects. We said that this was... And I first identify L was P1. And then the normal bundle was OP1 to minus D. And this is just... The, the global sections are just the homogeneous forms in two variables, the two coordinate functions of P1, of degree 2 minus d. So what happens is that the dimension of the space so when d equals 1, when the surface is a plane, then this is um, just linear forms in x and y. Of course it's a two-dimensional space. When d equals 2, I'm looking at constants. This is a one-dimensional space. And when d is greater than or equal to 3, then of course uh, I would just have the zero space here. The dimension is zero. Wrapping everything up, uh, this gives us the main result. So that uh, f of fs cannot have high dimension, uh, it cannot be non-reduced, otherwise we would have picked it up in doing these computations. There will be these fat points and apparently there are none. Of course one condition that we were doing throughout all this was uh, I'm doing all these cal calculations with the assumption that there is a line already inside of s. This may not be the case, in this case f is, fs is empty. Now one last uh, bonus fact is uh, that we see that the Fano varieties also for the plane and the quadric should be reduced because 
On the plane, for example, we saw that the space of lines should be just a dual plane and it should be two-dimensional. We see that at, at a point of the Fanner variety Fs, the tangent space should be two-dimensional, so that these dimension of these sections of the normal bundle correspond to the space of the tangent space at this point. And if there was any non-reduced structure, then I would have discovered a tangent space of higher dimension than the dimension of the space. So this 2 and 1 uh, also match the dimension that we've talked about before. The quadric has one dimensional space of lines. So we've inadvertently recovered that the Fano scheme is reduced for surfaces inside of P3 for arbitrary degree. So that concludes the goal that we have set for ourselves last week, and we can conclude the lecture and the proof here. See you on Monday next week.